Good morning and happy Friday to everyone on this beautiful Colorado day. It was up just to be up around high 80 today with scattered clouds and a possibility of showers later this afternoon. Now for a look at traffic. Right now there are no accidents to report, but volume around the metro is starting to really fill and get heavy. Looks like the 45 cold train is right on time this morning. Railroad quarter is really starting to stack up. Not the train. The train! Great. All right. Man, it must be a couple of miles long. It never fails. We're already late enough, and now this. What is up with all these trains lately? This is ridiculous. Nobody needs that much coal. But Mom, a train this size is barely enough to supply us for power for one day. That's crazy. Tyler, look at the size of that train. Besides, there's plenty of power to go around. We don't need it. Sorry, Mom, but no train, no electricity. Yeah, imagine that. No traffic. No electricity. We rely on coal to make plenty of cheap electricity. Every time we turn on the light switch, we know the light will come on. But making that light and all of the other electrical stuff in the city work takes a lot of energy. And it takes a lot of coal. Just yesterday at school, we learned about the history of coal mining and what it takes to get coal out of the ground so we can use it for electricity. Coal was first used by the Chinese in the 4th century to smelt metal. But it wasn't until the 13th century in England that people began to rely on coal for heating. They called it the rock that burns. At first, coal was hard to come by in Old England. There was a law that said that you couldn't dig in any forest or uncultivated land. The English were afraid it would interfere with their hunting. So most coal deposits in the interior of England were left untouched. But on the coast of England, mining for coal became more common. They needed a way to fuel their growing cities, and coal was the answer. Early coal mining was little more than digging a big hole or pit, breaking out the coal with a shovel, and then tossing it out by hand. Since everything was done by hand, the size of the mine was limited to how far you could throw the coal, usually about 40 feet. Those old English miners were known as colliers, or hewers, and it didn't take long for them to become experts in the ways of coal mining. The colliers were soon joined by putters, who hauled the coal, and by onsetters, who rigged the mining cars called corves. A windsman pulled the coal to the surface, and a banksman set it out for sale. Many strong English lads went to work in the coal mines. Most of them started when they were just boys. It wasn't unusual for boys seven and eight years old to work in the mines as trapdoor keeps. They worked 12 to 18 hours a day and earned about six cents. 
Technology has always been, and probably always will be, an important part of mining. It started early, first with buckets and chains, sometimes powered by a water wheel. Next came a variety of gadgets, like the wind gin and the cog and rung gin. They were powered by horses and could lift an entire mining car without removing the coal. It made the work go faster. But the mines still relied on strong backs. Even women worked the mines, hauling up to 170 pounds of coal in sacks on their backs through the low, narrow tunnels. Many times they worked the mines at night, after they had put their children to bed. Many of those English miners immigrated to America, and they brought with them their knowledge of mining. They helped develop the coal mines of Kentucky, Pennsylvania, and the rest of Appalachia. Eventually, they followed the drive to open the western frontier to states like Wyoming, New Mexico, and Colorado. By the late 1800s, America had surpassed England as the world's leader in coal production. Towns like Del Carbon and Cokedale grew out of the growing mining industry in southern Colorado. Those turn-of-the-century coal mining towns became crossroads of thousands of immigrants who had come to America from every corner of the planet. But life in those early camps was hard and unforgiving. The hours were long, the conditions could be unbearable, and the danger was very real. Explosions from pockets of dust and methane were fairly common. Rock slides and cave-ins were a constant threat, and the daily exposure to the dirt and dust of the mines made lung disease a virtual epidemic in the camps. Mining in Colorado from the turn of the century until today has been forged by sheer determination, by sacrifice, by blood, sweat, and tears. Those miners worked in spaces barely large enough to crawl in with little ventilation and the constant threat of danger. But through their persistence and hard work, they built an industry that fuels growing communities like Douglas County and the entire Front Range. Today, more than half of our nation's electricity is generated by coal. It's mined in 38 states and used in every state. Out here in the West, where coal is high quality, low polluting, and fairly inexpensive, we rely even more on coal to power our cities and our modern lifestyles. At 20 Mile Coal Company's Foidle Creek Mine near Steamboat Springs, Colorado, coal mining has evolved into a dazzling display of technology, science, and engineering. Coal mining is no longer pick and shovel. Coal mining is very high tech. We utilize a lot of computer controls, a lot of design, a lot of engineering, and a lot of training for our employees. Modern underground mines called long wall mines use a method of controlled caving whereby blocks of coal 1,000 feet wide by three miles long are extracted in three-foot increments to maximize coal resource recovery. The majority of coal is mined by cutting the face surface of the coal deposit with long wall mining machine shearers and continuous miners. These impressive machines can literally chew through the layers of coal buried a half mile or more below the surface. Massive hydraulic cylinders hold the roof in place while miners remove the coal. The coal is actually conveyed from the working face underground, which may be up to five miles away from the mine opening. At the mine opening, it's conveyed to surface stockpiles, which allows us to store coal for our customers. From the stored coal piles, it's conveyed to a crushing facility where it's reduced to two inches or less. Eventually, the coal reaches a high capacity loading station where it's put into rail cars that can haul 100 metric tons. At the rate of 20,000 tons a day, we will ship about two trains per day. 20,000 tons per day 
will power about 40,000 average homes for about a month. We're operating the mine 24 hours a day, seven days a week, producing coal at about half of that time. The remainder of the time is used for maintenance work. Underground coal mining is a tricky process, just as the miners at the turn of the century found out. Cave-ins, explosions, and dust are all problems that have to be avoided. Methane and other gases were a constant source of danger. Today, when methane gas is known to be present, it is often vented by pre-drilling the mine sites. Methane is created by the decomposition of any organic material, and the origin of coal is organic plant material. So over the millions of years of formation, methane gas was created through this decomposition. Some of it gets locked into the strata, some of it is bled off. At 20 Mile Coal Company, we have very, very little methane. So that is a blessing for mining conditions for us, but does not allow us to recover and process or sell any of the methane associated with coal seams. Technology and superior engineering have moved mining into new frontiers of safety and efficiency. For coal that lies closer to the surface, Open pit mining is a cheaper and more practical way of producing enough coal to meet our daily demands. Sometimes called strip mining, topsoil is stripped away in layers until the coal is exposed. For years, strip mining had a reputation for badly wounding the environment. But today's modern engineering has helped to create processes that are much more earth friendly. Now, the top layers of the soil are carefully separated and saved. When the job of mining is finished, the pit can be backfilled and the topsoil restored. The results often produce more fertile soil than before. Since 1974, more than two million acres of mined land have been brought back to life better than ever. Coal is a marvelous gift of nature. In addition to electricity, coal can be used to produce everything from paint to detergent even motor oil. And while we're producing and using tons of coal every day, experts predict our supplies of coal will last more than 600 years. Some predict it could last as much as 2,000 years as new deposits are discovered and mining techniques continue to improve. When it comes to electricity, coal is only the beginning. Here comes the coal train! trains are huge. I wonder how they get them over the mountains. For cities like Denver and popular surrounding areas like Douglas County, coal is the major source of electricity. Every day, we use it by the ton. And to bring those massive loads of coal to energy producing plants requires the coal train. We see them every day. Coal trains running alongside our highways and across the open valleys of Douglas County. We marvel at their size. And at the same time, we get a little frustrated by the delays they can cause at railroad crossings. Large power plants can use more than 60 carloads of coal every day of the year, and during peak seasons, the usage can be even greater. 60 carloads for just one power plant, that's a lot of coal. It's no wonder then that huge coal trains are common on railways all over the front range. Moving that coal requires a lot of horsepower. Giant locomotives have been moving coal across the Colorado mountains for more than a century. In southern Colorado, towns like Del Carbon, Walson, and Cokedale 
all relied on the trains to haul their coal to the steel mills of Pueblo and the power plants around Denver and Colorado Springs. Over the years, much of the coal production from southern Colorado and the Front Range moved to the massive coal fields of northwestern Colorado. Great deposits of coal were found just west of the Continental Divide, near Steamboat Springs and Craig. But as coal mining moved west, the towering Rocky Mountains stood as a formidable obstacle. Rollins Pass, just about 50 miles west of Denver, sits well over 11,000 feet. For westbound trains, it was just the first of many treacherous locations that needed to be overcome before they could reach the coal fields of the western slope. From the very first days of train travel in the Rockies, the weather has been a force to be reckoned with. Rollins Pass, then known as Corona Pass, could mean death to a train and its crew. Blizzards, drifts as high as locomotives, and 30 below temperatures tested even the most veteran crews. Mountain railways were kept clear of snow by engines equipped with spinning rotary blades to push the snow aside. Often the weather proved too much, stranding trains and closing the pass for two months or more during the winter. David H. Moffat, the owner of Denver, Northwestern, and Pacific Railroad, knew that building a tunnel under the Continental Divide would be the key to opening economically feasible rail traffic to the West. But just after the turn of the 20th century, few people supported his vision. He saw a main line that connected Denver and Salt Lake City, but his competitors like Edward Harriman of the Union Pacific and George Gould of the Western Pacific saw Moffat's plan as a threat to their virtual railroad monopolies. They threw all of their political clout against the Moffat main line. Undeterred, he first began laying rail west of the divide, hoping to build revenue through cattle and logging business. He next aimed his rails toward the coal fields near Cray. The engineering of the track is a work of art in itself. To maintain a comfortable grade of just 2%, Moffat and his engineers designed the track with a variety of horseshoe and circle shapes. The long trains curve and wind their way in every direction, slowly but surely gaining altitude. Moffat was a wealthy man, but his first attempts to build the main line forced his company into bankruptcy. His rails had reached Steamboat Springs, but the cost of operating trains during the bitter winter was more than his fortune could withstand. David Moffat died in 1911, still a few miles short of reaching Craig and a long way from building the much-needed tunnel under the Continental Divide. Finally, with a great deal of public funding, in February of 1928, the Moffat Tunnel opened to trains. Just over six miles long, the tunnel supplied water to Denver and a new way to bring coal from the fields of northwestern Colorado to the energy-hungry Front Range. Over the years, the Moffat Tunnel and the hundreds of miles of railways it serves have seen a variety of train traffic. In the 1950s, coal-fired steam locomotives gave way to new, modern diesel-powered engines the length of the coal trains grew to over a hundred loaded cars, and the mountain climb often demanded multiple engines to handle the grades. Today's modern trains still usually require a lead engine and helper, as well as engines at the middle and end of the train. Coal remains king of the Moffat Tunnel and the tracks of western Colorado. As many as nine loaded trains make the trip every day, and, of course, there's an equal amount of empty trains making the westbound trip for another load. The trip from the coal mines in northwestern Colorado to the rail yards just north of Denver is a test of man and machine.
NSF detector. Milepost 21.9. Track main 2. No defect. Repeat. No defect. Total axle 12. Temperature 32. Detector out. The trip into Denver is the end of the line for the heavily loaded coal trains from the northwestern coal fields. But it's just another step that brings energy to the front range by the trainload. Okay guys, let's unload the train. We've got electricity to make. Tyler, put your toys away honey. It's about time to turn out the lights and go to bed. Come on you guys, we're facing a power outage here. We gotta get the coal into the boiler. The final destination for mini coal trains is here at the Cherokee Station, just north of downtown Denver. 17 trains deliver over 200,000 tons of coal every month, making Cherokee one of the largest electricity producing plants in Colorado. Its four generating units can produce 724,000 kilowatts or 724 megawatts. Xcel Energy calculates that 1,000 customers can be served with just one megawatt. Coal trains are unloaded at a steady rate. Each car is literally flipped over, and it's 100 tons of coal dumped into a giant hopper. The couplers of the coal cars stay locked with a steady grip while the platform pivots. Cars can be unloaded without ever being uncoupled, it's just one of many ingenious feats of engineering that turn coal into usable energy. John, are you on 32 now? The coal is moved by conveyor and stored in growing mountains of black gleaming rock. As the coal is needed, it's crushed in pieces about the size of a pebble. More conveyors bring the coal to the boiler. Along the way, it's pulverized into a fine dust that's blown by fan into the boiler. Here, water is heated to 1,000 degrees to make steam. It's amazing to think all of that coal, hundreds of thousands of tons, are mined and carried by the train for hundreds of miles simply to make steam. The pressure and expansion of the steam is the perfect force to spin the blades of the turbine. As the turbine spins, so does the rotor of the electric generator. The rapid spinning of the rotor, which is essentially a large magnet, creates a huge electric charge. The turbines turn at 3,600 revolutions a minute, or 60 revolutions a second, which gives you 60 cycle electricity that we all know. In the meantime, as the steam begins to cool, it's collected by the condenser the condenser uses a different source of water to cool the steam. At the Cherokee plant, cool water for the cooling towers comes from the nearby Platte River. Half a million gallons of water are pumped through the cooling tower every minute. Some water evaporates in the process. 
In the winter, you've probably noticed the white large cloud coming from XL Energy's power plants. It's not smoke or smog, just water from the cooling towers condensing in the cold air and turning to fog. The water that doesn't evaporate in the cooling towers is filtered and pH balanced before it's returned to the river. Water inside the boiler and turbine is 100% pure without any minerals or other elements that might corrode the precision blades of the turbine. The purified water is reused, going through the process of being heated, converted to steam, and cooling back into water over and over again. Burning coal, like burning wood, leaves a certain amount of ash. This is ash. This is the byproduct of burning coal. Heavier ash is called bottom ash. It drops to the bottom of the burner under the boiler, where it can be easily collected. We collectify ash through bag houses here at Cherokee. A bag house is a piece of equipment that's much like a vacuum cleaner. We have thousands of bags that the air flows through the inside of, and these bags are about a foot in diameter and about 30 feet long. The dirty air goes on the inside and then is forced through the fabric material, which will capture the particulate or the fly ash. The clean air will go on out to the stack. The fly ash itself can be used in a number of ways, backfill in underground pipe stabilization. It can also be used as road grade stabilization materials. With this particular type of ash, we will put this into landfills to reclaim areas that have been dug out to bring them back up to a level where they can be used for construction of buildings and that sort of thing. Today's modern power plants can produce energy that can be 95% efficient, especially when they burn high quality, low sulfur coal found in the Western United States. The electric industry has invested more than $60 billion to improve the technology of coal-fired electricity. The end result is low-cost electricity that works with our need to protect our environment. Our power produced within the plant on our largest unit, our number four, is produced at 24,000 volts. It's then stepped up outside the plant at a main power step-up transformer to 115,000 volts, where it then is transmitted across our transmission lines, eventually to the end customer. The electricity that is produced by the Cherokee power plant is fed into the transmission grid by XL Energy. There, it becomes an important commodity that can be bought and sold yeah, and like sent to areas of demand. For our ending 18, to, uh, we just stick with the 125 and the 97 because they, they, they weren't moving full. They were close enough to full that we can go ahead and consider it, but it, I, couldn't, I couldn't ramp and I had to have the power. The Cherokee Power Plan is one of quite a number of power resources that we have available on our system. We have a variety of coal-fired plants, gas-fired facilities, hydroelectric facilities, and uh, a small amount of wind generation on our system. The transmission grid is similar to a highway system. We move power from large generation sources through the transmission grid to distribution points, which ultimately will deliver the power to our customers. This whole area of the western United States and southwestern Canada are all part of what we call the western interconnection. All the utilities in this region are interconnected with one another and operate at the same electrical frequency. We have communications facilities that send to us signals that tell us how much plants are generating, how much power is flowing through the lines, whether the circuits are disconnected in any way, and we receive that information through a variety of computers that we have here. We're constantly monitoring all that information some of that data is updated as often as every four seconds. We forecast the electric load on an hourly basis. The load is sort of a representation of what all the humans out there are doing. If they're working, if they're sleeping, if they're cooking, if they're eating. For example, we typically see that in the fall and winter, our peak electric load is about at five or six o'clock in the evening, 
as it's starting to get dark and as people are starting to cook. There's a very rough rule of thumb that it takes about a pound of coal to produce a kilowatt hour of electric energy. Now, a kilowatt hour is the amount of energy that 10 100 watt light bulbs would use in one hour. A typical customer using a thousand kilowatt hours of electricity a month would use approximately a half a ton of coal. The green map board is a pictorial representation of our electric system and our facilities throughout Colorado and the Denver metro area. Since most of our load is in Denver, about two-thirds of the center of that board are facilities just in the Denver metro area. Douglas County, with its wide geographic area, uses electricity supplied directly from XL Energy's power plants for its neighborhoods closest to the metropolitan area. REAs were established to provide electricity in rural areas. The cost of providing electricity is very expensive, and as you have less customers per mile, it creates a very expensive situation for each customer. Rural electrics were, were set up by the federal government to help electrify rural areas of every state. We buy our electricity from Excel, which used to be Public Service Company of Colorado. We mainly do the distribution of the electricity. So it comes to us at 115,000 volts, and then we break it down so the customers can use it. Accidents can happen, cars can knock down lines, and snowstorms or whatever. In emergency situations, we've had crews that go out in all weather to make sure that those facilities stay up. We also have a loop service. If we lose one end of our system, we can come in from another substation or another line to help supply that service. Intermountain is one of the fastest growing rural electrics in the nation. We happen to have all of Douglas County except for Highlands Ranch, but the, the largest growth is in our Sedalia area here. Coal is one of the most inexpensive ways to generate electricity today transmission lines located right next to the railroad lines that run right through Castle Rock. It has 115,000 volts that run into that substation. It breaks those down through the transformers down to 12,500 volts. We then distribute that off to the customers and into their homes. Even as other technology is developed and refined like nuclear, wind, and solar power plants, coal will still play an important part in keeping our neighborhoods running at full power. The amazing coal mines, the massive coal trains, and the coal-fired power plants are all essential parts of the electricity that we usually take for granted. Whenever you flip on a light, cool down with an air conditioner, or enjoy your favorite TV show, you can think of the energy it took to make it work. Coal delivers a train load of energy and a whole lot more. Lights out, partner. Night, Mom. Oh, and Tyler, thanks for the lesson today at the railroad crossing. I'll think twice before I wish there weren't any coal trains to wait for. Sure, Mom. Maybe I'll explain nuclear physics and computer programming to you one of these days. <laughs>
Night, Tyler. Night, Mom. So next time you're waiting for the coal train to go by, remember everything it took for it to get there. Maybe the wait won't seem so long. Night.